Uh, it should be good. Yeah, I think that's going to be good. Yep. Can you see me in that little spot there? Yes. Sweet. Okay. I've got some gags. So I keep you guys entertained as well. So um, I've got these springs so that we can like feel the tension. Of the so take one and pass it. Careful not to like shoot them around the room. <laughs> I tried this already, and that's what happened. Do we need goggles? Probably. <laughs> yeah, true. I yeah. So, legal things out of the way. I'm recording, and also I'm not responsible for any <laughs> sprains. Okay. Um, <clears throat> oh my PowerPoint. Okay to just do. Can, can I go into screen? slides? It's that computer. Is it able to share screen too? Can I just do it? So that shows us this. Okay, good. Am I good? Is that good? I think you're all good. You're okay. Participation. So I want to say basically that Bergson had two methods to do philosophy or metaphysics um, one by analogy and one by metaphor. Analogy is used in all of his major works but is particularly outlined in the essay, Life and Consciousness, which is in Mind Energy. Um, and this method draws up evidence through an introspective investigation that I'd call phenomenological, or we could say proto-phenomenological, if it makes anyone uncomfortable. Um, it's an investigation of the facts and data of immediate consciousness as they develop on multiple lines, and then he makes these lines converge in intuitions, which are both more expansive and more detailed than discursive reasoning. Metaphor is also ubiquitous in Bergson's text, but is outlined in particular in an introduction to metaphysics. Metaphor works in a similar way. It's also a convergence aimed at producing an intuition, but it uses imagery and inventiveness to conjure up intuitions artificially. In this brief talk, I hope to shed light on these two methods and on a few of Bergson's most insightful metaphors and to draw some phenomenological and metaphysical insights from all of this. And nowhere, as far as I can tell in Bergson's work, does he compare these two methods or consolidate them. But I also really don't see any conflict in this. Um, and I really think it actually helps bridge the gap between metaphysics and science in Bergson's work. So I'm drawing primarily on creative mind, which had the French title Thought and Movement, or more literally, Thought and Moving. Um, the book is a collection of essays and presentations given across Bergson's life, and uh, it in unpacks this like relation between thought and movement, um, which is the basis of his epistemology. Um, so thought tends towards sta space, <laughs> space, stasis, spatialization, generality. Um, movement, on the other hand, uh, eludes or escapes from these tendencies. Um, quote, comparisons and metaphors will suggest that what, sorry, will suggest what cannot be expressed this will not constitute a detour, it will amount to going straight to the goal. That's from Creative Mind. The goal here is to gain an immediate intuition of the mind by the mind, which is stated in the first quote on the handout. Metaphor and analogy have played an important role in metaphysics from Plato and Aristotle to Thomas Aquinas and even in early modern philosophy. Even a hyper-rationalist like Descartes is, delivers his ideas through metaphors and analogies. He began the meditations by inducing a sense of doubt and confusion at the wonder, at the ignorance we all live in prior to philosophical reflection. He shows that we begin when we begin to question our assumptions, we have a profound sense of the limits of our knowledge. This state of confusion can be even terrifying, and he gives a sense of this futility with a brilliant metaphor. Quote, yesterday's meditation has thrown me into such doubts that I can no longer ignore them yet I fail to see how they are to be resolved. And of course, Descartes wants us to feel the same way, so he gives us this vivid metaphor. Continuing, it is as if I had fallen suddenly into a deep whirlpool. I'm so tossed about that I can neither touch bottom with my foot nor swim to the top." End quote. The metaphor does a lot of work here. It's not, uh, not only in the narrative uh, of the meditations, but also for developing his argument. Descartes doesn't directly address the epistemological value of his metaphors or whether the metaphysics behind them is still possible without the metaphors. But I believe that the geometrical method 
only appears to do away with metaphor, and I love Spinoza and the geometrical method, I'm not trashing that, but what I think it does is it moves it into the scolia or into letters. Uh, so what is the power of metaphor here? Think about it, we are trapped in a whirlpool of confusion, we have no sense of a way out, but even in this hopeless state, Descartes can be witty and look at the situation in an insightful way. He describes this distressing state in a vivid way, making it come to life before our eyes as if it concerned us. This power of metaphor has metaphysical implications. It reveals a power of the mind to have an Apollonian clarity, to behold a vividly lively spectacle and be able to say, aha, I see, I understand. The metaphor provides insight even in this moment of incoherence and disorientation. Descartes was primarily concerned with creating a foundation for epistemology. And this is of course a grounding metaphor. Um, he only scratched the surface of the philosophical implications of this power of metaphor to induce intuitions. The power of the mind to know something, to clearly perceive it, and to recognize this fact is the fundamental intuition at the basis of Descartes' philosophy. And his main failing in the eyes of Bergson was to have overdetermined and distorted this intuition rather than developing it and deepening it. He could have spent his time investigating the moment of insight as such, and in that case, metaphor is just as potent as reason. The meaning of intuition is never clearly defined by Descartes, right? By, he gives these metaphors of illumination and natural light instead. The prevailing bias against metaphor, uh, to dismissing it as superfluous embellishments that should be eradicated from scientific discourse and substituted with straightforward concepts, that's a metaphor, obviously, um, is both misguided and founded upon the metaphor of return, right? All philosophers and scientists use metaphors. I agree with Jacques Derrida in White Mythology and Lakoff and Johnson in Metaphors We Live By, that metaphor is irrevocable and irreducible. Unlike these analytic and deconstructive approaches to metaphor, Bergson develops a methodological approach to metaphysics through metaphor. Descartes and other rationalist epistemologies can't reconnect imagination to intellect any more than they can the mind to the body. While this implies a real contradiction and fault line in the rationalist systems, it hasn't always been that way in philosophy. Um, there's this opposition between concept and metaphor, um, between imagination and concept. Uh, but for someone like Aristotle, that's not the case. And I have an article on metaphor and analogy that recently came out on Aristotle. His use of energeia is an analogical metaphor, as he says in the rhetoric which draws on phenomenological evidence of work, right, ergon, um, and disseminates this sense through his cosmology and ontology. Metaphor for Aristotle can help us triangulate and close in on principles which exceed direct and precise linguistic definitions. And I think that that exact same framework is found in Bergson, and I, my dissertation is on Bergson and Aristotle. Obviously, you can find it at a local gas station or wherever. Um, Bergson's metaphors, like those of Edmund Husserl and Maurice Merleau-Ponty, are not embellishments or embroidery on the periphery of a static and closed system of propositions which speak directly and exhaustively of their object. Metaphor sets the fundamental tone on which phenomena can be investigated. For Bergson, metaphysics is the key, or sorry, metaphysics is in the key of time or durée. We have to modulate our consciousness into that key in order to tune in to durational being. The first step in Bergson's metaphysics is to clarify the phenomena of lived duration by a method of cross-checking several metaphors. And this is in an introduction to metaphysics, and I'm gonna go into those metaphors in a second. Um, and that's in the second passage on the handout. He presents a series of metaphorical images, or yeah, images which I'm calling metaphors because they're, they are metaphors, um, which are supposed to mutually complement and complete each other while also canceling each other out. And this is actually kind of stolen from Plotinus, um, and Yankelevich mentions that as well. So I'm going to okay. Uh, each gives a unique perspective and insight, but also remains insufficient, a mere image. Um, and here, Bergson's Platonist tendency is palpable. Um, so I'm going to present and interpret these uh, metaphors. Um, these metaphors are not representations of duration, but devices that bring duration to life by facilitating a leap into intuition. Our vitality, for example, is not an image or representation we form of it. It's being and becoming exceed all translation of that concrete reality into words. The metaphors Bergson used to describe life and mind were meant to form a trend progressing towards real duration and away from the intellectual conceptions of matter, space, and symbols. 
Rather than ending in images and metaphors, his images act as a sort of tennis racket which swats us back over into immediate experience, which in turn provides us with evidence and inspiration on which to craft better metaphors. And that's, in, again, the second or first or second uh, quote on the handout. So this requires creativity and invention. Bergson drew on examples from art and aesthetics throughout his corpus, but focused, on, focused in on explaining the powers phenomenologically in a few places, such as in his book, Laughter. Um, and he says that the power of art is suggestion rather than expression. Suggestion has the ability to lift the veil placed over reality by our attention to life, which a lot of the talkers, speakers today have already kind of dug into. Um, the attention to life is the practical, conceptual, symbolic function of the intellect, which helps to negotiate the systems of life. And this process is um, it described with the metaphor of a cinema camera. So let's see. Hopefully this works. Oh no, request access to view the video. Why? <laughs> I totally give permission. Okay, let's see if the YouTube video works. Okay, I'm gonna have to jump ahead though. Now, here is the motion picture film. A oh. thousand feet. Sixteen thousand oh. separate photographs. Stay still, why is <laughs> Okay, this is where I go. To draw the picture on the screen, there is a bright light. With a reflector behind it to send the light rays in the right direction. And a lens to concentrate the light. The film passes a hole or aperture which lets the light go through only one picture at a time. There is another lens to focus the pictures on the screen. By adjusting the lenses, the picture can be made sharp and clear. Let's start the machine moving. The film pictures blur because they're moving all the time. And this won't do at all. We need something to hold each picture still long enough for us to look at it in between the changes. When the film is started and stopped in rapid succession, the eye sees the changes being made, and the result is streaks instead of moving. So we need a shutter to cut off the light while every change of picture is being made. Okay, basically that's how it works. I, I, I could have explained it. It was going to be fun with the video, but okay. So, um... Cinematographical mechanism is basically taking still images and pretending that motion exists when it doesn't by doing it rapid enough. The motion picture is actually an illusion of motion created by flashing static images in rapid succession. The mind as well as emotions, habits, and vital activities are instead like the shake of a kaleidoscope, he says in Okay, that's not gonna work either. Okay, well I had a picture of a kaleidoscope. We all know what a kaleidoscope <laughs> looks like. When a kaleidoscope changes, all the parts change in relation to each other, right? It's not piecemeal, uh, like building block, uh, one discrete part at a chain, time changes. The whole reorganizes together. And he opposes these two images in the fourth quote, which is insanely long from Creative Evolution. Um, and he says basically, the cinematographical character of our knowledge is dependent on the kaleidoscopic nature of our perception, which is a metaphorical way of saying what he said in T Time of Free Will, that quantity uh, exists because of quality, basically, or quantitative multiplicity emerges from qualitative multiplicity. Um, so then let's move on to um, the series of metaphors from an introduction to metaphysics. Um, so he has like, First, we're supposed to think of duration as of unwinding and winding up. So simultaneously, our duration is unwinding constantly, but it's also winding up. And this is a metaphor for the making and unmaking, which John brought up in the last one. So all the time, we're un unwrapping and rewrapping, right? And then we're supposed to imagine a point and which has no space at all, but which eventually starts to stretch itself and has an increasing tension as it stretches. When we listen to a melody or something like that, the moments of time are supposed to be increasing in tension over time as well. And you can squeeze your little springs now. Um, 
to get a immediate experience of what tension feels like. And then this was going to be also, I think this one, or another one, which I'm sure is not going to work as well, another video. Pushing the forward arrow. Is that not the right arrow? Did you push the space bar. Okay, the convergent lens is also not going to work, which is a bummer. Um, so he uses this example from Newton's light experiment where, you know, you take daylight, white light, and you put it through a prism, and it, everybody's seen like the uh, dark side of the moon album cover, and you get the rainbow. So the, there are an infinite number of nuances of color in the rainbow, right? And there are an infinite number of nuances in our perception of any change or of an emotion um, or any immediate experience. And so in this metaphor, the, uh, the pure light is actually made up of the infinite nuances. When we take a convergent lens and put the light back through the convergent lenses in Newton's light experiment, it turns back into daylight, right? So the, the, the different shades and different colors are actually constructively adding to one another in that example. Okay, and then he connects this to calculus. Would be great if that wasn't there. Oh. Okay, whatever. We don't have permission to see what's under there. <laughs> I don't know why. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. So basically, oops, that there same idea, and obviously Newton invented calculus and so did Leibniz, but um, Bergson uses this analogy or metaphor from calculus. I have an article that's I have two articles that are coming out on this um, process studies right now. So he likens many times life to the integral of a curve. So all of the infinite uh, differentials or fluxions, right? There's an infinite number of infinitely small changes within a curve. And uh, a derivative is taken from the tangent. So the film uh, snapshots, uh, any quantity we take of life is a derivative, and the derivative is not constructive, not generative of a curve. You don't actually make a curve out of an infinite number of tangents, right? But it does come from an infinite number of fluxions, or fluxes, differentials. Uh, so all of these metaphors you can see are kind of starting to pile up and converge on, with one another. And then again, the idea of a convergent lens. And, um, so you can actually think like, take the light, send it through a uh, prism, put that through a kaleidoscope, turn the kaleidoscope, then put it back through the convergent lens, and you have an intuition. So that's fun stuff. Um, which is made possible by his cone diagram. So each one of these, he says, is a shake of a kaleidoscope. Each plane, I couldn't explain this entire diagram to you right now. We would have to do a whole course on Bergson. Um, but these metaphors converge with one another. Um, like I've shown, basically. Okay. So I want to talk now just a little bit about more about this relationship between concept, intuition, and metaphor. Again, there's no gulf between metaphor and concept for Bergson. Um, you know, he he's very much against concepts a lot of times, but he also talks about like integral concepts or like concepts which perfectly fit one thing and include an infinite number of details within them. Um, and for Bergson, like, there, this isn't like necessarily two separate realities, intellect and intuition. Um, Len Lawler argues for this, and I definitely agree with this. And if you go to intellectual effort, it's where it becomes most clear that all creativity involves uh, intellect, and making up metaphors involves intellect, um, but just a different kind of intellect where basically the intellect twists on itself, as John said. Um, so just as for Lakoff and Johnson, so too for Bergson, concepts remain tethered to a matrix of metaphor and embodiment, to an umwell, to a gradual progress in which we weave together contingency, singularity, and invention. In human life, we always move between intuitions and concepts by the tissue of metaphor. Metaphors provide a vehicle for moving from one domain to another, and for contrasting one concept to another. There is a difference between the phenomenal evidence of intuition and metaphorical evidence, but their difference is also blurred. Both can afford us intuitions, 
and all good metaphors in philosophy are based on subtle phenomenological insights. We actually need to squeeze the spring in order to get in, uh, a sense of this. We actually have to, you know, take the sugar cube and drop it in the water and sit there with it. Um, phenomenological evidence can be evoked by and needs to be enriched by metaphorical comparisons and analogies, but both are possible only on the basis of prior phenomenal experience. This is my take now. This is not, I'm not drawing directly from Bergson on this. Um, but they are deepened and developed. These experiences are deepened and developed by uh, metaphor. So um, it is on the basis of intuition of our own duration that we can understand by analogy the duration of other things, right? Um, so when we deepen our understanding of musical duration, for, in, for example, we also deepen our understanding of other forms of duration. The encounter with a melting sugar cube is not a metaphor for lived duration, but an occasion to encounter our duration and its way of, the way in which we gear into the duration of other things. What appears at first, and that's why he does it at the beginning of Creative Evolution, right, when he's ready to like show us how to move duration into the realm of science and life. What appears at first as a metaphor can also be developed into a phenomenological insight. From both metaphors and from intuitions, certain metaphysical implications can be drawn out. Bergson thought there were important metaphysical implications to something as simple as waving his hand, right, which he does at the beginning of several of his talks. This is not merely, I'm sure you all just derived a lot of metaphysical insights from that instantaneously. <laughs> this is not merely a metaphor for duration, again, uh, but is duration itself, an indivis the indivisibility of movement, the gesture occasions our experience of the indivisibility and transience of duration. If we bring reflection to this experience, metaphors can help us get our bearings, uh, but the expression of these realities will never substitute the duration in which it is unfolding. The metaphors themselves must be transient and must dissipate, and this is what he describes again in the Introduction to Metaphysics, um, as we pass on to the things themselves in duration. So we don't end in metaphors, uh, but metaphors are our vehicle. Um, you know, he also brings us many examples similar to the sugar cube. Is it already melted? It's faster than I thought. Um, the continuity of a melody, which we talked, well, John talked about. Um, memorizing a poem, right? Uh, it's supposed to show us the difference between recollection and habit. Um, examining convergent evolution in the eyeball um, on different paths of evolution. Um, and forming analogies based on phenomena of this sort, uh, by forming analogies of this sort, metaphysics itself is like the evolutionary convergence of lines of facts, as again he said in Life and Consciousness, um, which can then be studied and developed phenomenologically deepened through this metaphor concept uh, intuition. Uh, movement. We achieve intuitions by breaking with our habits, uh, but also by inventing new tonalities for metaphysical thinking. In a longer version of this, I would go on now to look at the way metaphor is what makes possible interdisciplinary cross-pollination and transdisciplinary scholarship, looking in particular at thermodynamics, cybernetics, and this whirlpool analogy that, uh, which is used in self-organization. And then I would end by comparing Derrida and Bergson, arguing that the former forecloses the possibility of a metaphysics lifted from metaphor relevé, as he said, but also insisted that uh, philosophy's only other possibility to move forward was that of deconstruction, right? Derrida doesn't really build a metaphysics after deconstructing, so that would be what the comparison. Bergson's metaphysics is not simply derived from metaphor, but opens a feedback loop between phenomenology and metaphysics and science in which metaphors inventively enrich our intuitions and reciprocally enrich, are in, reciprocally enriched by moving back and forth between these two poles. And this is again what he calls twisting, the twisting of the intellect. Um, and this leads to new concepts, integral rather than derivative concepts, woven in a tapestry of metaphors which organizes intuitions and lets them converge in higher novel emergent forms of order by a new shape of the kaleidoscope but anyway, so yeah, to conclude, metaphor lets several images converge in an intuition of duration, then secondarily we can understand the duration of other things by analogy to our own inner duration. Great, thank you. All right, we have some time for some questions for John. Yeah, Patrick.
what would the status of an example be? Because I have in mind here, the South is a great writer of examples. And they're not quite tokens of type, but they're also, I don't, I don't think they're quite metaphors on the way that you quite distribute them. They're not straightforwardly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I wonder how, how you know, what status the example has. Yeah, I mean, I think that the example can become a metaphor. Um, and I think, I mean, so for example, <laughs> for example uh, the re like reading a poem, uh, memorizing a poem, right? And so the example in that case is a real phenomenon that discloses some phenom like phenomenal aspect of our consciousness um, that we can derive sort of phenomenological, metaphor, physical implications from. So I think that they uh, sort of analogy and metaphor and examples all have a similar status for Burke's own, but they just move in different directions. Because, yeah. um, as you probably well know, with the aerosol background, uh, analogies, metaphors have a definite ratio, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. The shield is a wineless cup. Mm -hmm. or yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The sunscreen. Yeah. Or something like this. yeah, yeah. Whereas an example would not necessarily have that ra True. Ra rationality ratio. Yeah. Idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, for Aristotle too, the. Um, uh, analogy is a way of gathering witnesses, right? And uh, making an induction. Um, and the examples given form the analogy um, by seeing the differences and the similarities. Um, so I think that they're, uh, they're uh, reciprocally uh, imply each other and need each other. Yeah. Uh, more questions in the room? I think you might have started to answer my question toward the end there when you talked about the difference between integral concepts and derivative concepts. I want to ask you about that. Um, but my, my question was just about the relationship between metaphors and, and concepts. So, um, you know, one way to look at the person is that he's substituting metaphors for concepts. He doesn't like concepts, so he's using metaphors in, instead. Mm -hmm. But um, Deleuze, for example, suggests that he's in the business of inventing new concepts yep. mm -hmm. and concepts that are in, in some way um, truer to your experience. Yep. Or, yeah, I mean, the way Bergson uses concepts is, is pretty weird, and it's very similar to Deleuze in some ways, like inventing a concept in a book and, and then never using it again, and like not drawing on it again, um, like qualitative multiplicity, like that, that, that term doesn't come up in later books. He'll, he'll use t terms that are very close to it um, and kind of hint at it, like the multiple unity of the self and things like that in, in uh, an introduction to metaphysics. So there's almost this like unwillingness to stick with the concept once it's been created. Um, and um, so, I mean, it, it, all, it, it also seems like a concept is something that only works for one person in one problem, and it only works because it leads to some sort of invention um, that, that, that then leads to making something new and changing things, right? Um, so there's like no stasis involved in the concept um, in Bergson's positive use of that concept. Um, I don't know if that totally answers the question, but like I think that these are all like I would say concepts that he uses, and like also some of these are drawn from. I mean, most of these are drawn from the history of philosophy in some way, um, and then he unpacks those through different intuitions, which is kind of where examples would come in. I, I, I would think that intuitions is kind of like examples. And then there are metaphors which illuminate those. And I don't think that we can stay with any of these. Um, the purpose is that we see how they each only re reveal some aspect of some reality of duration without being duration itself, right? Uh, another room, uh, room question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm thinking of conversations I've had that have really boiled down to fighting over metaphors, mm -hmm. right? And I'm sure, I'm sure you've had this as well, you know, is it a cone or is it more of, I don't know, a spiral, <laughs> right? Uh, and you kind of get going back and forth and finally somebody cuts in and says, it doesn't matter, right? We know what we mean, yeah. um, right? And so I guess I, I kind of want to figure out, are metaphors, are, are those conversations important to clarify the metaphor mm -hmm. Um, or are they only important insofar as they help us, we call them a vehicle at one point, mm -hmm. as a vehicle toward understanding. And once everyone in the room is understood, mm -hmm. the metaphor can vary as long as we all get the basic. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that this 
gets back into this problem of discovery and and um, invention, right? Like, uh, you know, if if the metaphor is only a vehicle, then we'll get to the metaphorless like pure beholding of, of things. But um, that I think is completely ruled out by Bergson. And like, what we're getting to through metaphor is a new opportunity to make better metaphors and get somewhere new where we can invent a new either morality or a new metaphysics or a new ontology or whatever. Uh, and when we get to that new spot, it's not gonna be somewhere where we stay. It's gonna be a new problem that we can now investigate. <laughs> um, and yeah, so, so I think that while metaphor is a vehicle and it's definitely not an end goal, that's like clear in that one quote, um, it's also not something that will, it's not the like uh, rockets that fall off and then we get out of space and, uh, and get out in, past the atmosphere or whatever. You know, like, we don't ever get past, uh, entirely past metaphor, um, I don't think, or Bergson. Um, I don't know uh, if I'm allowed yeah. to talk to people. And, and <laughs> how about things or items that are not open to conceptual analysis? I'm thinking of a certain notion of God, mm -hmm. uh, of Heidegger's mm -hmm. being, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, Levinas, uh, other, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they are introduced. Mm -hmm. How are they introduced? Through metaphors only? Can they be seen? Uh, there's no intuition, not even, I think, a Bergsonian intuition of them. Right. There's no concept for them, at least that's what the defenders say. Yeah. There's yeah. no concept. Uh, would then whatever is said about them expressed only in a metaphoric kind of way? I wonder. It's I just wonder a real, too. I it's mean, it's a real question. Yeah, like Bergson doesn't really give us much like yeah. theological or anything yeah. like like to answer that with. But I mean, I definitely think that you know the idea that we're going to get to a beholding of a truth like in front of us yeah. um, is already like a metaphorical thing. It's very problematic when we get into that realm of questioning. So I don't know how much Bergson has to offer us there. Like his interest is much more how to. Uh, motivate us to oh, invent a new religion or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I don't know if I have yeah. a. <laughs> yeah. I think we can yeah. squeeze in yours as well. Yeah, uh, I think my question is quite similar to the previous one. Um, and I really like the, the suggestion or the, the idea that for back some metaphor and analogy are different ways of doing philosophy. And I think mm -hmm. you wanted mm -hmm. to say more about that. So, would you say that, uh, for example, metaphor is Bergson a way of dealing with the limitation of our language, for example? So I guess at one point, or towards the end of the, the presentation, you said we somehow begin with phenomenological intuitions and you, you use metaphor to kind of amplify or sharpen the intuitions yeah, yeah. that you have, and then we don't end there, we arrive at the concept of thinking and so on and so forth. Um, so would you say that, um, for Bergson, the use of metaphor to do philosophy is a kind of remedy to the limitations of our language. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And a kind of follow-up question would be kind of similar to the previous question. If so, then and if metaphor is also a kind of playing with our language, would it also be kind of a limitation in metaphor or what we can think or what we can philosophically talk about? Uh, even if we have this powerful tool of metaphor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean this is one of those like perennial like questions of like in Taoism like let's start by saying nothing that can be said is like <laughs> the right thing to say <laughs> and like but then we go on to like say stuff and like Burke some people say the same thing like okay if we can't use language to do metaphysics then like why write books and stuff like that uh, and, I, and again I think that the the gulf between intellect and intuition uh, Burke Stone himself overplayed it especially in creative evolution um, and in like the lectures that are coming out right now um, it's way they're way closer to each other and the, and the relation, but the, the necessity of intellect there um, in, in all intuition is much clearer. Um, but yeah, I think that the, the limitation of language is within its cinematographical tendency. And there is another tendency, uh, which is the suggestive tendency in art and, and in an introduction to metaphysics, he brings in the novelist um, a bunch of times, and and then in the course in the lecture courses that he was giving at the same time, it's it's another place where he talks about this a lot, where uh, the the novelist has uh, a 
multiplicity of personas that they themselves are. Not all of them are actualized. They're all mostly virtual, uh, but they have these tendencies and they're able to tap into those more and make come to life all of these lives that don't actually live and make us live them and make us live things we've never experienced before and have never had the power to experience. Like he says that um, uh, Rousseau invents the feeling of the sublime and no one felt it before that, really felt it before that, and now we all feel it uh, because of that. So language has the possibility to do that and like language has a rhythmic aspect to it, a musical aspect that it can also tap into. Um, so while it has limitations, it can also do things that go beyond its possibilities. Um, yeah, and like, well, I could go keep going on, but I think we're out of time, probably. Yeah, yeah, th there's a lot more to say here. I, I think I, I would love to ask all three of you a unifying question, but I think it is time for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so let's Perfect. thank John Bagby. Yeah. Thank you. I know we all have the same name technically, Sean and John, or anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna break until 1.45, so it is lunch from now until then. Yes. And uh, I hear rumors that there's a cafeteria on campus. I have no use for these. Make fun of either coffee or something like that. <laughs> they are um, there is a student dining hall. Um, if you if you exit here, go to the right. Um, I say like go to the right, cross the street. Um, you'll walk uh, into a place called the UCC or the University Center. Um, in the University Center, once you enter, take another right, uh, and as you kind of keep walking down the hall on your left, you'll see. Um, what basically is something like our food court. Um, they've got a bunch of different options down there. Uh, I'd say most of the food in there is good. I wouldn't eat uh, anything from the Mexican offerings because you can do better, obviously, in San Diego, so I'd stay away from that. Uh, but the sushi's good, the pizza's good, the Chinese food and the Vietnamese food are actually really good. Um, so that's probably the quickest bet for food. Um, if you didn't want to eat campus food, um, you could walk uh, off campus, um, just follow the road all the way down the big, big hill, which you may not want to walk back up. Um, and, uh, and then from there, there's a kind of a small strip mall, uh, and there were a series of restaurants in there, Italian, uh, a vegan option, uh, and uh, Japanese ramen, and, uh, and Thai food. Uh, so if you want not to eat university food, take a left and follow the hill. Uh, when you get to the bottom of the hill, take a right, you'll see the strip mall. Yeah. If you want a university option, take a right and then cross the street and the UCC. All right?